Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Sickle Cell Action Network, a weekly internet radio show presented by Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative and sponsored by Mass Therapeutics. We are coming to you live from Indianapolis, Indiana, and we are here to serve you by providing up-to-date information and opinion on all matters pertaining to sickle cell disease. My name is Gary A. Gibson, and I am your host for the next two hours. Let me start by saying that I don't have sickle cell disease, nor do I carry the sickle cell trait. In spite of that, I am no stranger to sickle cell. Quite the contrary. You see, even though I don't have sickle cell, it has had a very huge impact on my life. That's true because its complications took my wife from me after 12 years of marriage. It also caused her to have a miscarriage that resulted in the loss of our twin babies that she was carrying while in a sickle cell crisis. So all told, sickle cell has taken three lives from me, and I feel the pain of those losses every single day. I currently serve as the President and CEO of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative, a community-based organization that has been serving people with sickle cell for over 45 years. Each day I attempt to transform the pain of my losses into positive energy, energy that is focused on making a difference for those who are battling sickle cell. From being involved with sickle cell for over 40 years, I am able to say that much progress has been made, but there is still so much work to do. This show is an opportunity to contribute to the ever-expanding dialogue about sickle cell that is taking place all around the world. Our show is about raising awareness, but it is also about so much more. I like to say that sickle cell awareness is important, but we need more than awareness. Those living with sickle cell are already aware. That makes me ask, so what are we doing for them? My answer is, not enough. That's why we've named this show the Sickle Cell Action Network, because awareness without action has very little impact. We want this show to be a source of information and a call to action to help those who must live with sickle cell in their midst. We have designed the show to provide information that is beneficial to patients, caregivers, family members, and friends alike. Most importantly, we want people with sickle cell to know and understand that they are not alone. The Sickle Cell Action Network show features live guests who are health care providers, patients, advocates, and others who are engaged in the fight to eradicate sickle cell and ease its burden on those it affects. Today, we are honored to have two very special guests to talk to us about sickle cell, uh, pediatric sickle cell care. Joining me in the studio today are Dr. Emily Meyer, a pediatric hematologist at the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center, and Ms. Corey Singleton, the parent of a young man with sickle cell. We're honored and thrilled to have both of them with us today. Before we get to today's topic, however, I want to share some of our upcoming topics with you so that you'll know what we're going to be up to. In future weeks, uh, we will cover such topics as transitioning to adult sickle cell care, connecting the sickle cell community, the global state of sickle cell, sickle cell research updates, uh, depression and sickle cell, connecting the sickle cell community, etc. So as you can see, we are serious about putting it all out there, and we hope that you will join us every week, same time, same station. If you've missed some of our previous editions or wish that you could listen to them again, don't worry. Just go to the Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative YouTube page, and you'll find them there. Now, let's get on with our show, and we'll start with this week's edition of Sickle Cell News Update. Um, for my guest, uh, as you know, we, we always try to try to bring information forward so that people can know that there is a lot going on in the world about sickle cell. One of the stories that we want to uh, share with you today uh, comes from India, and a lot of times people don't realize that Uh, India is one of the very largest areas of people, uh, population, uh, sickle cell populations. Um, This particular story comes from Nagpur. It says, during the state sickle cell disease awareness week observed between December 11th and December 17th, parents of kids suffering from the genetic blood disorder sickle cell wrote about the problems of their children to Chief Minister Devandra Fatnavas. Having received around 1,700 letters across the state in a week, she wrote back to the NGO, or this uh, non-government organization, that started the letter-writing campaign, calling them for a discussion. The city-based non-government organization, the Sickle Cell Society of India, had a list of eight demands that they felt would make the lives of sickle cell patients and their families easier. These demands were put on postcards and that the parents of children with the disease sent to the chief minister's office during the winter session. As soon as the letter stopped pouring into the office, one was written to the president of the uh, non-government organization, uh, Sampat Ramteki, informing him that the chief minister would personally discuss the issue with the members. At the end of this meeting, Fatnavis 
issued an order for another meeting with the officials of the health department to resolve the long-standing issues. Um, the chief minister told the delegation that all of the letters and demands put up by them had been forwarded to the state's public health department, and he assured them that a meeting with the officials of the health department would follow soon. So not only in America, but also in India, people are asking their governments for help. Another story comes to us. Um, this one is coming out of the recent uh, American Society of Hematology meeting that was held um, a few weeks ago. But this story, I think, is pretty interesting. It's, uh, it starts by saying it's no bigger than a credit card, but it may someday save the lives of countless infants in struggling nations. At the 57th annual meeting of the American Society of, of Hematology, or ASH, a team of researchers hailing primarily from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, presented their ongoing work on a mobile device capable of detecting a number of genetic blood disorders, including sickle cell disease, in a much more efficient fashion than conventional tests available currently. Aptly called the Hemachip, the device would enable formerly undiagnosed infants to receive the prompt medical care that, they, that they'd need early on, preventing later health complications and even death. Um, while sickle cell newborn screening is standard in the United States, very few infants are screened in Africa because of the high cost and level of skill needed to run traditional tests, explained project researcher Dr. Little, associate professor of the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, in a statement. This new mobile technology provides an easy-to-use, cost-effective tool that takes us closer to standardizing newborn screenings on mobile devices, thus simplifying diagnosis. It could make a huge difference in developing nations worldwide, enabling early treatment for this disease. Little is also the director of the Adult Sickle Cell Anemia Program at the Seedman Cancer Center of, of University Hospitals, which is affiliated with Case Western Reserve. The hemochip uses a battery-powered technique known as cellulose, cellulose acetate electrophoresis to identify a person's varying types of hemoglobin, a protein that helps red blood cells transport oxygen throughout the body. So the importance of something like hemochip is hard to overstate with the project members citing research from the World Health Organization stating that 70% of deaths attributed to sickle cell disease in Africa could have been prevented with early detection and medical intervention. It's estimated that over 6 million people alone in West and Central Africa currently have sickle cell disease. So another step there to try to help identify sickle cell disease in areas uh, where right now the screening does not take place. Another story that we'd like to share also comes from the ha ASH conference, the American Society of Hematology, um, and it says uh, data back transplant as cure for sickle cell, and I think this is a, a pretty exciting story. Um, more than 90% of patients with sickle cell disease remained alive and free of clinical events three years after receiving HLA matched sibling stem cell transplantation, and this is from data from an international registry. The three-year overall survival rate was 94%, and event-free survival uh, was 90% among the 1,000 pediatric patients included in the analysis. Good results were obtained with bone marrow derived or peripheral blood stem cells, but a multivariate analysis showed that bone marrow as the source of stem cells led to significantly better event-free uh, survival. The findings reinforce stem cell transplantation as curative therapy for sickle cell disease and should encourage pediatric hematologists to engage patients, uh, parents of patients with sickle cell disease in discussions about stem cell transplantation as a therapeutic option, said Barbara Capelli, uh, MD of the International Observatory on Sickle Cell Disease at Hospital St. Louis in Paris. This study showed excellent three-year overall and event-free survival with HLA identical sibling stem cell transplants, Capelli said during a press briefing. We observed limited transplant-related toxicity despite the use of my myeloblative chemotherapy regimens. 
Um, so again, a good story there. The data is showing what we've been hearing, which is that the stem cell transplants do make a huge difference. And the last story for today, uh, earlier in October on our show, we told you about the daughter of the president of Nigeria. Her name is Zahra Bahari. And we told you that she had committed to help people with sickle cell in her country. Uh, Zahra Bahari um, is, as I said, the daughter of the president. And this story comes to us from the nation in Nigeria. And, it's, and it says, Zaha Bahari knows the importance of hard work and wakes up each day determined to impact the world the best way she can. She rocks her silver spoon with a purpose and constantly seeks to give back to the society. The stunning daughter of President Bahari is a focused young woman who understands the importance of maximizing opportunities. And unlike some other silver spoon kids who love to lavish money on parties, Zahra channels her money and energy into good causes. So here's the good part. As she turned 21 on December 18th, she showed some love to more than 430 children suffering from sickle cell disease. With the support of her mother, the Sickle Cell Aid Foundation ambassador presented cartons of drugs to the foundation and spent quality time with her, with them. So uh, thank you so much to Zahra Bahari for um, coming down out of the palace to spend her birthday with 430 kids with sickle cell. I think that's a tremendous story. So those are our stories for today. That's the Sickle Cell News Update. We're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Emily Meyer and Ms. Corey Singleton about pediatric sickle cell care. Do you or does someone you know have sickle cell disease? Have you heard about the EPIC study? It's an international research study evaluating an investigational drug aimed at shortening the duration of painful crisis. And with over 50 sites in the U.S., there may be a site near you. To learn more and to find out if the EPIC study is right for you, visit www.theepicstudy.com. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm your host, Gary A. Gibson. And with me today are two very delightful people, uh, Dr. Emily Meyer from the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center and Corey Singleton, a self-employed um, accountant, I guess it is, um, and mother of a, a grown son now with sickle cell. But we think that these two people are going to be very beneficial to you today um, as we talk through pediatric sickle cell care. We're going to start by uh, asking Dr. Meyer and, and then Corey to tell us a little bit about themselves. Um, and, and that's something we always do just so that our listeners can get a feel for who they're listening to. So Dr. Meyer, if you don't mind, please tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from originally, where did you obtain your medical training, how long have you been practicing hematology, and, and also let people know, for those that have been listening from the beginning, uh, this is your second appearance, and thank you for coming back. Well, thanks for having me, Gary. I'm glad to be here and talk today. Um, so I grew up in northeastern Indiana on a farm, um, and I uh, had I was a pediatric cancer survivor. I am a pediatric cancer survivor, so I actually got into medical school saying I'm going to do pediatric oncology. Um, I went to medical school at Indiana University um, here in Indianapolis, and then after medical school, I went to um, Washington, D.C., where I did my pediatrics residency. And while I was in Washington, D.C., they have a very large number of pediatric sickle cell patients, about 1,200. And during my first year of residency, I was touched and um, moved by all of the patients and families who were fighting sickle cell. And I felt really compelled and called to start um, helping them and taking care of them. So I did my uh, fellowship training in Washington, D.C., and then I was an attending physician out there for about um, six years. So in total, I've been doing pediatric hematology for 10 years um, and focused primarily on sickle cell patients. Wonderful, cell. wonderful. And Corey, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born and what do you do for a living? I did kind of give a teaser on that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> That's okay. I am originally born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I moved to beautiful Indiana because I wanted seasons about three years ago. Um, I do accounting uh, independently for multiple companies. Um, and I love Indiana sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> 
so far so good with our our winter uh, <laughs> not a whole lot of snow or anything which is which is good and it's actually just now starting to get cold so that's good Corey, how old was your son when he was diagnosed with sickle cell um i thought about that this morning and it's kind of a, a really funny story uh lathan was about a month old and i had a knock on the door and it was about 8 o'clock at night, and I walked to the door, and I said, no solicitors. And the lady said, no, ma'am, we're not soliciting. We are from uh, Baptist Hospital, the social worker's office. And I turn, and I say, Mom, why would they be coming here? And she says, well, open the door. Well, they come inside, and I'm like, welcome. Is there something wrong with one of my brothers? Are they in trouble? Did something happen? And she says, ma'am, can I come in? Would you sit down? And I said, sure. I said, what can I do for you? And she says, well, we need to tell you that your son has sickle cell. So you weren't even suspecting that? No. Although it does run in my family, I do have an aunt um, who has passed from um, problems with uh, sickle cell. And I also have a niece who also has sickle cell, and she is 26. However, I thought that my child was perfectly fine we were not going to have any issues um but it turned out that we were completely wrong and how old was he he was a month old okay. so this was the result of uh screening is a newborn screening was it newborn screening that i had no idea about okay so you didn't even know they were doing the screening did not okay wow so do you remember your initial reactions to the news I asked my mother what was she talking about, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and if she was joking, and told her to leave him and started crying. That's actually <laughs> something that happens a lot. Um, people get the news and and they they panic, um, and I think it's understandable. It is. It was it was easier um, when my mom explained to me that it was hereditary, and I knew that I had the trait. However. It was, it's up until you know now lately where you it's a question like in dating do you have sickle cell trait you know we didn't ask those questions mm -hmm. back then mm -hmm. you know so now a lot more people are aware right well we wish that they were more aware because that still isn't happening to the level that it should be happening correct you know, there are still people that uh, um, are either unaware of their status or if they're aware they're not aware of their partner's status correct um, so we're still trying to ensure that we're educating people about that um, dr meyer i'd like you to educate us about how you go about treating infants and toddlers with sickle cell um, let's say that you're seeing a six month old for the very first time um, what are the things that you would do and and tell us why you do them so um, the first thing that we want to do is make sure that families are educated about the disease because they're kind of our eyes on the ground. Um, since they're with the baby all the time, they need to know what to look for. Um, and, you know, since sickle cell is a blood disorder, it can affect really any organ in the body. But because most families are still trying to come to terms with having an infant who is diagnosed with sickle cell, we don't want to overwhelm them with too much information. Um, so I typically start with um, the three things that I'm most concerned about in infants, the first of which is infection risk. Um, and so we talk about the importance of penicil taking penicillin every day, twice a day, um, the importance of um, looking out for fever because unlike children who don't have sickle cell disease when babies or toddlers or really anyone with sickle cell has a fever they have to go immediately to the hospital because they're at very high risk for getting serious life-threatening infections um, so to make sure that families know the importance of that um, the second thing I focus on is um, spleen palpation because the spleen, which is an organ that's on the left side of the belly, um, acts as a filter for the germs and it doesn't work properly in children um, with sickle cell disease and it's at risk for enlarging very rapidly and causing um, really serious anemia. And so we teach families how to feel for the spleen um, during clinic visits. Um, and make sure that they know that when to look for the spleen getting large, like signs and symptoms of worsening anemia. How often should they check the spleen when they're at home? I, I typically um, recommend doing it at least once a day, like with a diaper change or with a bath, just so that people know what normal is. So then if okay. they're worried that their child is severely anemic or, or that the spleen may be big, then they can kind of tell the difference um, between normal and abnormal. It makes a lot of sense. 
Um, and then the third thing I always talk about is pain. And it's not that I'm worried that a six-month-old is going to have pain. It's just that that's the most common complication of sickle cell disease. So I think that's what families are most worried about um, for their baby is that they don't want their baby to feel pain. And so what to do if and when their baby has pain. So those are the three things. You I know, some of our, some of our uh, um, listeners might, might wonder because they've heard a lot about the higher risk of infection mm -hmm. with uh, young ones with sickle cell. Why, is, why, uh, why are they at more risk? So there's two reasons. First of all, because that spleen um, doesn't work well, and so the spleen is really good at filtering uh, bacteria that have kind of a sugar coating around them. And so children with sickle cell, before newborn screening and before penicillin prophylaxis started, that was the leading cause of death in babies with sickle cell. And it disease. still is in those parts of the world that we talk about, like Africa and definitely, India. Definitely, right? definitely. That's one of the news stories that you talked about, definitely. And then um, now we also have vaccines against those t germs, and so we want to make sure that the babies get all of the vaccines that are recommended for childhood. Um, the second cause, the second reason they're at higher risk for infection is because their immune system doesn't attack those um, sugar-coated bacteria as well, and so it's kind of a two-hit um, mm -hmm. philosophy on the immune mm -hmm. system that puts kids at higher risk. Mm -hmm. um, is it, it's often true, I think, that parents are not very informed about the nature of sickle cell, especially with regards to, you know, their first child. Um, would you say that your experience bears that out as you're seeing uh, patients and families for the first time? Are you, what do you think about their level of knowledge when it comes to sickle cell? I think it depends. I think some people immediately go to the internet and so then they start reading about sickle cell disease. Um, but we certainly come into contact with families who aren't aware that there's a cure for sickle cell, like you talked about, the bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. um, some families come in on, at their three-month visit asking for hydroxyurea for their children, which is the only oral medicine that we have. Right. Um, some families have read some of the side effects for the medicine, so then they're, they're more hesitant. Um, so it certainly varies. And okay. um, also, if, it, if other family members have been affected by the disease, then they oftentimes families have more um, understanding of of what, it, what it's entails. Okay. Um, Corey, uh, let me give you the same question from a different angle. Do you feel that you were well prepared for taking care of your son during the early stages of his life? I will say had it not been for my mother, my aunt, and uh, my family, no way in the world would I have been prepared. Okay. How did they prepare you? Um, they all cared for my aunt. So they okay. were well aware of what was needed okay. and the things that I needed to to do, and they were with me the whole way. Okay. Okay. Um, do you think that you hmm, – what would it have been like if you didn't have that support system for you? I would have been on the Internet. I would have been that mom 100% on the Internet with questions. Um but back then, you know, there was not a lot okay. out for you. Right, right. So I think that the best we could do was the best we could do. Right, okay. Um, so, Dr. Meyer, getting information from parents is critical when it comes to treating children with any illness, but because of its nature, it might even be more important when the child has sickle cell. Would you please explain how getting good information from parents helps you do your job better? Um, sure. So getting information to families, I think it's, it's important for us to have the same knowledge base um, with, the, with respect to the infection risk. But certainly the risk of infection is lower now with the vaccines, um, but still, you know, unfortunately children still die of infection in the U.S. in 2015. And so we want to do everything possible um, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and also, the, the thing I struggle with as a pediatrician is talking about um, prognosis in sickle cell disease because you have this... I think we talked about this last time. Yeah, yeah. I think so. It's um, important. Go it ahead. Is. Because I think, you know, you have this gorgeous baby in front of you with a, a new family, and you don't want to scare the parents because we know now that 95 to 98% of children who are born today will, will live to see their 18th birthday. But then after after adolescence or in young adulthood, then, you know, the organ damage from the disease starts to really have its effects. And so you want to make sure that you don't take away the family's hope 
um, but that they also know that sickle cell is still a very serious disease and that we need to be aggressive in its management. And so it's, it's, it's hard to kind of strike that balance, um, but it's something that you, I use the cues I get from the family and clinic, and, and sometimes, you know, if, a, if it's a family who I think maybe is more nervous or more worried, I'll bring them back sooner to see us in the office. And the other thing, too, that we have at IHTC and most sickle cell programs have are a good um, network of support so that there are nurses working with us, social workers, other um, physicians, nurse practitioners, and so it takes a whole team to, in order to provide that comprehensive care for children with sickle cell. Great. Uh, I think this is great information. We're happy that you're listening. Uh, we're going to step away, take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue. Hi, I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host for the Sickle Cell Action Network Internet Radio Show. If you are impacted by sickle cell disease in any way, whether you are a patient, a caregiver, or a friend, you need to join me every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I promise that you will find our show to be full of information, perspective, and opinion about all things sickle cell. See you Tuesday right here on RadioNext.tv, the Cool Groove site. You're listening to the Sickle Cell Action Internet Radio Show on RadioNext.tv, the Cool Groove site. My name is Gary Gibson, and I am your host, and I'm very happy to have with me in studio today Dr. Emily Meyer and Ms. Corey Singleton, and they're talking with me about pediatric sickle cell care. Um, and we're going to just kind of pick up where we left off, and we're going to go now to Corey and ask her, uh, Corey, how often... Uh, did your son have crises when he was an infant? As an infant, um, he had two. Okay. Uh, before the age of two. They were very mild. Um, he was only hospitalized for a short amount of time. Uh, however, they were unsure that he was in crisis because his hemoglobin was high um, was normal, should I say, but they kept him anyway uh, because of areas they could not touch, areas that he didn't want to be he didn't want to be bothered with you if you touched him in a certain way in a certain area. So they kept him and found that as much as they thought that the blood test could tell that he was in crisis, um, just according to his hemoglobin that that was not so true. So after the first one, um, that was rough because he was stuck a lot of times with them wondering if it was a crisis or if it was just a pain someplace else, maybe something going on with the stomach. Uh, they, In other words, not necessarily related to sickle cell? Is exactly. That, okay. They looked for everything outside of it, but when you have a baby that's crying mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. um, for no reason, no fever, no, um, what do they call when your stomach is tight, um, constipation, none of the above. Um, so they had to assume that it was uh, a crisis. Mm -hmm. So going in the second time, they assumed as well, um, this time actually getting to the pain a whole lot quicker um, and not trying to search for everything else, x-rays and and you know things that were unnecessary because to me for me I knew my child I had probably the calmest happiest child on earth and for him to scream bloody murder at two years old constantly that told me that he was in a crisis mm -hmm. so once we got to know once they got to know us and uh, know that Lathan was a very calm baby, very relaxed, didn't cry for anything. You could hang him upside down and he was not going to cry. Um, they had no choice but to to listen. Um, and then the next one, I think he was, he was three, um, they had done everything they could to prepare him to have surgery. Um, he was having his tonsils and his adenoids removed. Um, so they did everything they could. They had every doctor in there they could from um, x-ray technicians to, um, what's the one that, uh, I can't 
can't think of that doctor for the breathing. Pulmonologist. Oh, yes. Pulmonologist. pulmonologist. They had every, to cover every basis, they they had someone there before the surgery. Um, at that time, they were very into blood transfusions, and I actually did not agree with blood transfusions. So we had all of my family tested just in case something went wrong with the surgery. And um, everyone gave their blood. And the only one that was a match was my sister-in-law and me, which doesn't count because I carry the, the I carry sickle cell. So um, his hemoglobin dropped probably two notches from nine to seven. And they went on ahead and gave him the uh, transfusion. And the transfusion dropped him down to a four, which is very low. Um, so that made for the surgery to not be so successful and for him to be in the hospital uh, for 13 days instead of three. Um, so we learned that we weren't doing those anymore unless it was absolutely 100% necessary. Um, so th from two to three, we did three, and they were probably the most horrifying three years of life. Um, but he did really well after that, so we're grateful. How how did you cope with that? The first time, I was probably more frustrated with the doctor, so it took my it took everything off of being so worried and stressed. Um, second time, don't know. I I I think I just had to if if I stayed calm, he stayed calm. Um, did I go out into the hallway and cry? Heck yeah, I did on the regular basis. Did he see me cry? No, he did not. Um, I spent a lot of time. I didn't leave. That's for sure. Um, so it's it's very trying on 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 a parent, but you know to stay strong for your child, never let them see you cry, gives them the strength to to deal with it, no matter how old they are. So as he got older. Um, did the frequency and severity of his crises change any? And if so, how? He went a whole two years without one um, after that. Didn't have another one until he was six. Um, change of altitude. We had gone camping, of course. That was going to um, bring one on. But we were always prepared. We lived with pain medicine in our hands, so we were always ready for it. And after six, he had a very normal life. He played soccer, he played football, he played basketball, he did everything he wanted to do until 14. Okay. 15, I'm sorry. His sophomore year in high school, um, he was playing varsity football, and he had, he had always had a habit of getting winded quickly, but he never wanted to come out of the game, so he stayed in the game, and uh, he had actually gone four years without being hospitalized um, with mild crises that we could handle at home, nothing major. And then at 14, 15, they were coming one after the other. So we went to see his, um, pediat his pediatrician who specialized in sickle cell, and he flat out just told Lathan there would be no more football. You're done. Mm -hmm. It's over. Mm -hmm. You've had a great five, six years, you're, it's, it's over for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Meyer, you know, listening to this um, and, and recognize that some of what you're telling us, Corey, was many years ago now, um, because Lathan, your son, is how old now? 23. 23. Okay, so in the earlier years, it was like 23 years ago or whatever, things have changed since mm -hmm. then in terms of treating. You Could you kind of comment on that? Sure. So when I started um, 10 years ago, we were not prescribing hydroxyurea, which is the only right. oral medicine for um, sickle cell, to treat sickle cell, um, to, to all children. Um, we limited it to the children who had the most severe um, forms of sickle cell, SS, 
um, and those kids who had lots of pain crises, so who were in the hospital at least three times a year for pain, who had the recurrent pneumonias of sickle cell disease called acute chest syndrome. And now, because of improvements in care and research studies, we are now offering it to any child um, who has SS or S-beta-0 thalassemia at age one year. Um, and that's because of a, a mm -hmm. multi-center study that showed that hydroxyurea is safe in mm -hmm. young children. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't affect growth or development, um, and it actually prevents pain crises and um, acute chest and the mm -hmm. number of transfusions. And so now we're, we're able to offer that to all children. And um, where I came from in Washington, D.C., we were one of the participating centers in that study. It's called the Baby Hug Study. And there are now 10 and 11-year-old children with SS-type sickle cell, which is the most severe form, who don't know what it's like to have pain. Mm -hmm. And they've never been admitted for pain because they were randomized to the group with hydroxyurea and then their families chose to continue it after the study ended. Hmm. And so I think that's the goal now mm -hmm. of, of pediatric hematologists is to have a, a group of children with sickle cell who don't know what it's like to have pain. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the big improvements in the care. Of the we talked last cell. week actually about um, the study that I think it came out during the ASH conference too about mm -hmm. the fact that it looks like hydroxyurea is even uh, helpful with stroke in preventing stroke. Yes. Um, did Lathan have any strokes? No, he has had pneumonia now four times. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, you know, I think uh, Dr. Meyer too, if, if, if Lathan had been on hydroxyurea back then, mm -hmm. perhaps the outcome could have been different and he might not have had all of those issues. Well, he has SC, so he oh, would have okay. been, not, however... They wouldn't have included yeah, Exactly, him. as I have a, a niece that has SS and her crisis are very far few and in between. Mm -hmm. right. And she's older. Right. No, she's, she's older. Yeah, she's two years older than he is yeah. and her crisis are very far few and in, in between. Well, we're going we're gonna to kind of touch on that in a few moments here. Um, what, Dr. Meyer, you know, we talked about, and we're kind of on this topic now, how sickle cell can be so varied from patient to patient, mm -hmm. and that um, we talked about that the first time that you were on the show, um, and we were talking more in general terms, but now let's talk with regards to pediatrics. Um, how difficult is it for you as a practitioner to go from patient to patient as you see all of these variations? Mm -hmm. Well, it's hard for me personally because I feel like I need to I need to be able to tell families what to expect. I'm a planner. I I'm sh I don't know if everyone's as much of a planner as I am, but I would one of the fr most frustrating things about sickle cell is its unpredictable nature. Um, and so not being able to tell families, this is, your child's going to have this many pain crises or this many pneumonias or this many, you know, whatever, um, is really frustrating. And you have families who have children with SC and you tell them when you first meet them in the office that this is a more mild form of sickle cell disease. And you always, I always put a caveat, in most cases, because we certainly have yes. had patients in D.C. and certainly in Indianapolis who have as many, if not more, painful crises than patients who have SS-type sickle cell. And no one can explain why. Right. We, we've, everyone's been searching for what that one thing is that can say, this is the bad player. We need to you know, put this patient on the transplant list sooner. We need to put this baby on hydroxyurea, even if they have SC. And that's kind of the holy grail of sickle cell. No one's been able to, to figure that out. I was going to ask you this, too. You mentioned when in our story uh, or in our news stories earlier today, we talked about uh, the success rate of uh, the transplantation. Mm -hmm. Are you recommending that to patients now? Well, we recommend, so um, there's a cord blood storage program now. So for families who have a child who's affected with sickle cell disease, if they have another pregnancy that's a full sibling, um, Oakland Children's Hospital will store, with in conjunction with Viacord, will store the cord blood for free um, for five years for, ch for families who have an affected child with any disease that's cured by transplant. And so we recommend that all of the cord blood, that families sign up for that program and at least store the cord blood. Um, and then I always encourage my patients to at least know what their options explain, are. Explain how that helps. The cord blood? Yes. So the cord blood can be used as a source of the stem cells that um, right. can cure the disease. So the, the sibling can have the trait. So if, if the sibling has the trait, they're still eligible and or then 
you don't have if they don't have the trait. So if they have AA, um, it, unfortunately, it's a one in four chance of having a matched right. sibling, okay. and that's for anyone, even mm -hmm. if you don't have sickle cell. Um, and so it's it's not a sure thing that you'll have a match, but it, it's at least worth storing the cord blood because that's a, an expensive procedure, and it's something that we can we can use. So this is a this is something that's available for free. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. yep. So people need to know about mm -hmm. that. Okay. It's called the program's called Sibling Connection. Sibling Connection at Oakland, Oakland Children's. Oakland Children's, yeah, it's okay. run through there. Yeah. Right, uh, wonderful. Um, so, Corey, you've you you, how, you, you were kind of touching base on this. You you have a niece now that has that has sickle cell, and it's manifest different with than than with your son Lathan. Yes, it's kind of opposite. She was sick more when she was younger where Lathan was not, and now as he is older, he is sick more. Than she is. Than she is. And she's two years older? Two years older. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, we're having a great conversation with Dr. Meyer and uh, Ms. Singleton. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and continue our discussion about pediatric. Do you or does someone you know have sickle cell disease? Have you heard about the EPIC study? It's an international research study evaluating an investigational drug aimed at shortening the duration of painful crisis. And with over 50 sites in the U.S., there may be a site near you. To learn more and to find out if the EPIC study is right for you, visit www.theepicstudy.com. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network, and I'm Gary Gibson, and I'm joined by Dr. Emily Meyer and Ms. Corey Singleton, and we're talking about pediatric sickle cell care today. Um, we're going to circle back to something that uh, was mentioned by Ms. Singleton. Uh, Corey, you talked about how your son uh, played different sports until he ran into, um, you know, the doctor basically saying stop, uh, at least when it came to the football. I'd like to take that now to Dr. Meyer and say, Dr. Meyer, what, uh, what, how do you handle that as, as, a, as a doctor? Um, do, do parents ask you, is it okay for my child to play? Uh, and, and what do you say to them? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, sports is obviously a big part of childhood, adulthood, adolescence, and so lots of families ask about that. Um, I typically tell families that I like to watch football, but I don't like any of my patients to play football. Um, and that's just because of the nature of the game with the full pads and the helmet and the typically the training happens in the hottest months of the summer, right. um, which puts people with sickle cell at risk for sickling and a lot of breakdown of their red cells, which can make them very, very sick. The other concern is, is that in people who have SC disease, their spleen often... Um, still is around when they're teenagers and so they're at risk for having a large spleen and if you know heaven forbid they get hit on that side of their abdomen they would be at risk for having their spleen rupture which can be a very serious um, complication so that's really about the only sport that I say no to um, you know other full contact sports like rugby or if someone's at a very high level of martial arts where they may get hit very hard in the abdomen um, then I usually say no to um, but anything else I, is fine as long as the coach and the athletic uh, staff knows that the child has sickle cell disease and that they know that they have to take frequent breaks um, and drink lots of water. So basketball, mm -hmm. baseball, those yeah, are more. Those are okay. Those the, are okay. You know, basketball at the high school level and college level, oftentimes that can be a pretty can cool be contact. physical. Yeah. So you know, it depends on what position. If it's a shooting guard or a point guard, that would be okay. Those forwards and the centers where they're down um, under the basket getting elbowed a lot. So for parents that hear you and say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, my kid plays basketball or my kid plays baseball, what would you say to them in terms of checking them out after they come home from practice or anything like that? Shouldn't that be something that, that takes place? Definitely, and they want to make sure that their child always stays well hydrated so that and that they stop and take breaks so they don't get too overheated, too dehydrated. Um, because those are all things that can trigger a crisis. Right. Okay. Great. Um, what does your experience tell you, Dr. Meyer, about, you know, how sickle cell changes as people get older? First, we talked about the variation uh, from patient to patient and, and the, I guess, the unknown nature of why that is. But we also see that as, as patients get older, and, and based even on what, what uh, Corey just told us a little while ago, you know, the frequency or the severity of the crises may change as, as patients get older. 
Um, so how different is it for you as a uh, practitioner to treat somebody that's 10 years old uh, versus uh, a toddler? Well, it's, it's very similar. What Ms. Singleton said is true, that when you're trying to take care of a baby or a toddler who's having pain, you're totally dependent on, first of all, the, the parents and the family's experience with what, what the chi- how the child normally acts, and then you have to use the cues that the child's giving you. So if the child is crying and doesn't want to walk, um, then you know that he's probably having pain. Or if you've got his favorite toy and she's not reaching for it to grab it because maybe her arm hurts or her hand hurts. So you have to use all these, ver- these nonverbal cues. Um, and then you want to make sure that you give them enough pain medicine, but not too much pain medicine that they get constipated or that they get pneumonia. Um, whereas a 10-year-old is often better equipped to be able to talk to you and say, you know, I don't feel well, this is what hurts, I don't, this doesn't feel normal, those kinds of things. Um, but then you also have to deal with the fact that the 10-year-olds are starting to become more independent, and so maybe they won't tell their mom and dad everything. Um, and so you off, sometimes you catch it later, or the pain has gone on for a, a longer time, and then that sometimes makes the pain harder to manage. So it's, there are challenges with both both age groups. Interesting. So let's say a 10-year-old says uh, there's a little birthday party they want to go to, right. so they maybe aren't going to tell their parents that they're right. f- not feeling yeah. well. And so then it becomes incumbent upon the parent to stay observant, mm-hmm. right, and, and kind of pick that up, yeah. which I think is one of the keys that we, uh, one of the key takeaways that we need to let people have today is that as a parent, you really need to be observant. You really need to be in tune with your child uh, to know what's normal and what's not normal mm-hmm. when it comes to a behavior or whatever that can be a clue to the manifestation yeah. of sickle cell. Okay, very good. Um, and then let's change our focus a little bit more. Um, Corey, as a, pac- as a parent, w- what kinds of steps did you used to go through in determining whether or not your son needed to go to the hospital? This is always a, a big issue. Um, because everybody wants to stay away from the hospital if they absolutely can. It was much easier when he was younger. Okay. You know, when he was, you know, 14, when he was 14, 15, it was, it was easy. Okay. You know, mom, I'm in pain. Okay. Did you take your pain medicine? Yes. Is it helping? No. Let's go to the hospital. We were okay because the visits were not frequent. Right. So, so this he, is when he was older. This is when he was in his teens. In his teens, okay. And when, when he was a baby, you can always get a baby to go. What right. are they going to do? Right. So, <laughs> right. Um, but he was always willing to go, you know. Uh, it was never, well, Mom, there's a party, or Mom, I want to hang out with my friends, or if he didn't feel well, he didn't feel well. Mm-hmm. And that is one thing I will have to say that's, that has made it very easy. Um, he can be a little stubborn on when we went, and he would name his level of okay. when we would go. Okay. Um, he was reasonable. Pain level of a seven. Reasonable. So we would work with that. We'd go. Um, and the visits were not very long. So um, we kind of worked on the the talking and the pain level and how, how have we tried to get it down? How have we worked with it at home? Um, are you resting? Or are you running around the house? Are you staying up playing video games? You know, so we worked a bunch of different factors in before we decided, okay, you know, let's so, go. But you had a threshold of, what was it? You said seven? Was seven. It seven. If it was seven, you'd go. To yeah, we like seven. Okay. <laughs> now now I like five, now six. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you think that's kind of good advice, Dr. Meyer, to, to maybe help establish ahead of time that, you know, um, to be prepared? You know, when we hit a certain level, we're going to the doctor? to the hospital yeah I think so and I think I think the level is different for each each family Um, you know people have different tolerances for pain and so I don't know that it's necessarily always a seven but I think it's whatever the family feels comfortable with managing at home okay can you can you address that a little bit Mm -hmm. uh, different tolerances for pain Mm mm-hmm so, so we know there, there's more um, research that's being done on people's sensitivity to even like pressure and touch and cold and hot. And we know that patients with sickle cell disease have um, increased sensitivity to all of those things. And there's certainly genetic variations among people about who's more sensitive um, versus not. And so that certainly plays a role in how 
um, people experience pain and and there are other extenuating circumstances like if you have a big final at school that you're stressed out about or you know if you've had a relative who's moved away or passed away and that even that puts everyone um, makes everyone more sensitive and takes away some of those other coping mechanisms that people use to deal with pain and so there are there are lots of different reasons why people you know experience more or less pain hmm. okay um, so you court Corey had a seven as a threshold. Dr. Meyer says others may have different levels. Was there anything else that you would go through, what thought process you might go through to say, you know, let's go to the hospital? I mean, and, and what I'm kind of getting at is that going to the hospital is sometimes a big deal. Um, for a lot of people, it's always a big deal. But you know that you're going to be incurring additional expenses. Um, additional hit on your um, finances. Mm -hmm. um, is that a part of your decision or not? No. Um, the one thing that has always told me that even if he says that it's not, you know, if it's a seven, I can tell the vessels in his in his head they they move different. So I can. He probably doesn't know this, but right. it's okay. my little secret. I hope you're not listening. <laughs> uh, it's my telltale on how much pain he's in. Yeah. So that that for me is my telltale. He can tell me anything he wants to, and I can go with it. I'm the final word. I let him go. He's pretty good. He was always been very good about knowing what's too much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, playing football and you know, having cousins and horse play, you know, mm -hmm. boys will be boys. But that is his telltale. I know that he is, he's reaching a level of, of serious um, discomfort. You know, I wonder, what kinds of things would you do at home to try to avoid going to the hospital? So let's say he's getting close to that threshold of seven uh, maybe he's five or six what steps would you take to try to keep him uh, I'd call try to calm him um, I did a lot of massaging of the areas that were um, he, that were in that were in crisis um, ankles wrist um, you know we did a lot of watching whatever movie he wanted to that was going to make him happy okay. um, Benadryl he because of the the offset of the medic so much medication he would sleep and sometimes he'd wake up and he'd be back down to a three sometimes he'd wake up and he'd still be the same so if he woke up and he was still the same we're going it's only going to get worse mm -hmm. um, because there are those onsets you know there were different times you know if I knew he had gone swimming yes we're going to just take pain medicine we're going we're gonna to do it before and we're going to do it after the things to, to eliminate how bad it can get right um but in a situation of it's just an onset and it's not going away we just lose the thought of trying to figure out how to cope with it at home so yeah what, what we're getting at here is taking proactive measures to ensure that you're getting the best relief as soon as possible even if you don't have to go to the hospital yeah we are very proactive if he did anything that i felt swimming um, too much horseplay out in the cold with the friends. You come in. Oh, let's let's just uh, be a little proactive. Even if it was just simply Advil, I was proactive about it. Let's let's try and stop it before it even goes any further. Mm -hmm. um, he had a thing about holding his arms above his head and walking, and it told me that he was having issues breathing mm -hmm. so we would we would have to sit and do different kind of breathing things for fun okay um so you know there are a lot of ways to be proactive they don't have to be um running to the hospital because that's definitely not any answer the kids are just going to hate their lives mm -hmm. so you know we would do fun stuff play video games i don't like video games <laughs> but we would play video games and 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 do whatever i could to calm him down and and make him happy and kind of not focus on the pain and I'm very bad at asking okay what's your pain level now okay what's your pain level now 
mom, stop asking. I got to ask because <laughs> right. if we don't talk about it, right. you know, I'm right. just going to make the decision for you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that he is about tired of me asking what's your pain level. <laughs> um, so also as a parent, you know, you go through these steps and then you get to the point where you say, no, no, we've got to go. We've got to go to the hospital. How difficult is it, is it for you as a parent to turn the care of your son over to others once you get him there to the hospital? Oh, boy. <laughs> I did not. I mean, I did. They had to care for him. Yes, they had to They had to make the decisions for him, but did I allow them to do it without any input that I, if I disagreed, there was no way in the world that Okay, would say that again. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way in the world that was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very... Lathan did not spend very much time alone at the hospital, especially um, as in pediatrics. I don't think he did stay alone. I always had someone there with him. I don't think that it was until he was 18 that he actually was allowed to uh, stay alone, and that's because he moved away. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, so if he was still here, yeah, he wouldn't be alone, probably. Nope. Right. Okay. Well, it's, it gets to be a little different. Um, you know, Lathan is not the type. He doesn't speak up. Nurses absolutely love this kid because he doesn't speak up. He doesn't complain. He doesn't ask for anything. He always says please. He always says thank you. But that's almost a bad thing because he gets to be forgotten. So our thing has always been we sit there, Lathan, speak up. Late than speak up. But what people fail to understand is that as much medication as they're on, I can tell them five times, Lathan, make sure that you ask for your, um, I, your anything, Benadryl. Mm-hmm. He's going to forget. And if no one's there with him, they're surely going to forget too. So making sure that they eat, making sure that they're getting enough to drink. Um, that's on the that's on the parents. That's on me. That's on that's on me, because if they don't speak up, and they're they're sleeping ninety nine point nine percent of the time, if they're in a bad crisis, hopefully they're getting to sleep. But if they're not, you know, no one's paying attention to what their needs are, and if no one is there, they're not getting what they need. Right. Well, and and from a pediatric perspective too, it. it really helps us take care of the patients better because you're right the nurses have multiple patients who they're taking care of and so if if there's not a family member at the bedside to help the child remember to get up to do their intensive spirometry all those things it really yes. it really does improve the care um, and it also helps if you have you know if they the hospitals we have been lucky enough twice to be in rooms with other sickle cell mm-hmm. patients mm-hmm or um, down the hall or something. And the, I've had two parents that have been in the situation where they have other kids. Um, one, one young lady had moved from Tennessee, um, was trying to work and take care of her daughter, and she had her son in the hospital. They were kind enough to move him in with Lathan because I was there all the time. So, you know, he had someone to look after him, and she was very worried about that, whereas the same thing happened in another situation in California where the mother had four other kids, and the poor little boy was there all the time by himself. Anything Lathan got, he got. You know, it, it's coming together and helping each other out that makes a world of difference. Right. And as I've never had to ask anyone but family to look after my son, people don't have that help or resource. Right. So it's all about people helping each other to maintain you know, help these kids maintain comfort because when parents or family are not there, that makes the crisis even worse. Yeah. Right. Scary. Couldn't have said that any better. Good, good advice, uh, Corey. You're listening to the Sickle Cell Action Network, and we are a service of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative. Uh, we are a community-based organization in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
We provide support and services to people that have sickle cell disease. We also uh, provide education to the community, and we advocate for those who uh, are battling sickle cell and living with it in their midst. We're 45, almost 40, I guess 46-year-old uh, organization that is dedicated exclusively to sickle cell, and we are leading the charge with efforts like the Sickle Cell Action Network. We'll be right back to continue our discussion with Dr. Emily Meyer and Ms. Cor- Do you or does someone you know have sickle cell disease? Have you heard about the EPIC study? It's an international research study evaluating an investigational drug aimed at shortening the duration of painful crisis. And with over 50 sites in the U.S., there may be a site near you. To learn more and to find out if the EPIC study is right for you, visit www.theepicstudy.com. Thank you for joining us here today on the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and I'm very pleased that we are sponsored by Mass Therapeutics. Uh, Mass Therapeutics is a uh, biopharmaceutical company headquartered in San Diego, California. MAST is currently leveraging the molecular adhesion and sealant technology platform derived from over two decades of clinical, non-clinical, and manufacturing experience with purified and non-purified polaximers. MAST has developed a drug called MST-188 as a candidate for serious or life-threatening diseases with significant unmet needs. Among those needs is the treatment of sickle cell disease. MAST is currently enrolling sickle cell patients in a clinical trial known as EPIC. EPIC stands for Evaluation of Purified Palaxomer in Crisis. If successful, EPIC could result in the first treatment of its kind to treat sickle cell disease patients while they are in crisis. The EPIC study aims to determine whether MST-188 can shorten the duration of a painful crisis. MST-188 is an investigational drug that has not been approved for commercial sale in any jurisdiction for any use. MST-188 potentially improves oxygen delivery and may help keep blood vessels from becoming blocked and more obstructed. It may improve blood flow by stopping cells from grouping together. It also may reduce inflammation and it may restore cell membranes and give damaged cells time to heal. Interested patients should know that EPIC participants will receive their normal pain treatments during crisis and that there is no cost to participate. Interested patients should also know that participating in this study could not only help themselves but might also help future generations of those yet to be born. If you're interested in learning more about the EPIC study, please visit www.theepicstudy.com. Thank you to Mass Therapeutics for sponsoring the Sickle Cell Action Network. Speaking with Ms. Corey Singleton and Dr. Emily Meyer about pediatric sickle cell care, uh, pick up the conversation with another question that I'm about to ask Dr. Meyer. Dr. Meyer, I'm sure that you usually give thorough instructions to parents when you're releasing their child back into their care. In your opinion, do parents generally follow your guidance? Yes, I, I think they do. I think um, I think the hardest part is after an acute pain crisis. Um, most of the time, we'll recommend uh, to give the pain medication around the clock um, for at least forty-eight hours after discharge. And I think it's it, it would be hard for me as a parent, so I'm assuming it would be hard for other parents to wake their child from sleep in order to make sure they get their pain medicine. So sometimes kids will continue to have pain for longer periods of time because, it, because the oral pain meds don't get them through the whole night of sleep, and so it may wear off um, after you know six or eight hours. So that's one thing we do try to stress to the families that you have to wake your child up to make sure that they get the pain medicine because it's given orally now and not IV like it was in the hospital, right. which can be given while the children are asleep. So. Right. You know, one of the things I, I think people might wonder is, you know, the dosages. When you get around to prescribing um, painkillers, how, how do you make a determination on the actual dosage that they're going to be giving their children? In pediatrics, most of the doses it, dosages are based on um, a milligram per kilogram of body weight because it's not, you know, you can't give an infant the same dose as you give a 15-year-old. Um, however, 
pain medication, if children need it regularly, they often develop a tolerance for it. And so sometimes they'll need a higher dose than what is within the prescribed range. So it's based on the family's experience with what has worked in the past and in combination with the child's weight and the child's size. And do you prescribe the same types of uh, medications for children as you would for um, adolescents? Yes, yes. Just different dosages. Just different dosages. We, we used to do a lot more Tylenol with codeine um, for the younger kids, but about 30% of African Americans don't have the enzyme that's needed in the liver to, active, to uh, metabolize the codeine into its active form. Um, and so, Interesting. So now we just usually prescribe the oxycodone to everyone because you don't need that enzyme to convert it to its active form. Just learned something. Me too. <laughs> Um, okay, Corey, as your son reached his teenage years, did it come become more difficult for you to get him to follow doctor's instructions? And if so, how did you manage that? Yes and no. I, I'm going to say typical teenager. I'm going to do it when I, I'm, I'm going to do it, but just not right this moment. Mm -hmm. um, just have to stay on him. <laughs> he knew what he had to do. But with any any other adolescent or teenager, let me just run over here really quick and play this game, and I'll be right back, Mom. <laughs> or let me run upstairs and change my clothes. I'll be right back, Mom. And they think you're going to forget, and they forget. Uh huh. Um, but it it's it's again, teenage, you know, little babies. You we're still in charge. We're still the parents. We still have to pay attention. There, it's it's for us to make sure that they're taking care of business. Now, does he complain about it? No, he just forgets. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and it's very common. You know, Lathan, take your pain medicine. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with any kid, when they get into doing something else, it's hold, please. Mm -hmm. You can't let them hold. Mm -hmm. They can't let them put you off. They have to make sure it's being done. Mm -hmm. And even though he's now um, not pediatric, but um, do... Does he take hydroxyurea now? He does. Okay. Do you? When did he start? Um, only, I'm going to say four years ago. Four years ago. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to go with because he was SC, not SS. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense to you, yes. Dr. Meyer? Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I like to say that SC is kind of the orphan disease within an orphan disease. If, right. Because a lot of people consider sickle cell disease right. an orphan disease. And most of the research has been done in patients with SS and S beta zero thal because those are the those are the people who have more strokes, they have more pain, right. um, and so we don't have a lot of great therapies for SC. And because of that C hemoglobin, hydroxyurea has um, intermittent effects. It depends on the on the patient again, and I can't tell you which patients will respond and which patients won't. So. Uh, I think we want to clarify because some people don't understand that orphan disease, mm -hmm. but orphan disease is a disease that affects fewer than 200,000 people, if I'm not mistaken, based on um, one of those federal agencies that has that determination. Yeah. In the U.S. In, in the U.S. Right, in because US, there's right. certainly more than that in the world. Absolutely. Yep. Well, we just had yeah. that story at the beginning of the show that said yep. there were 6 million people, at least in Western Africa, yep. with sickle cell. Mm -hmm. Which is something that we still need to get at. How many people really do have sickle cell? It's um, a problem that we're trying to address here in the United States with the program that we're working on at Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative with the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America and the Health Resources Services Administration of the United States government on a project that's known as Get Connected. And in that project, we're attempting to identify people that have sickle cell disease who we do, don't know about. Um, and the intent is to uh, get them connected not only to each other, but to resources that are available. Um, wonderful time to be living with sickle cell because there are more resources available than ever before. So we want to help people get connected to those resources. And we also want to uh, get an accurate count of the people that have sickle cell. So a part of this project is also the establishment of a national registry of people with sickle cell disease, which is something that you know, other uh, uh, more commonly referred to diseases have already registries, and this is something that sickle cell disease needs. And we want people to understand that the importance of the registry is it helps to establish a baseline of data, and that data is what's used by the federal government and others to establish that there really is a need. And as we look at 
uh, certain um, uh, numbers and statistics that we see from time to time. Um, you know, right now you could see anywhere from 60 to 130,000 people with sickle cell in the United States alone, depending on what source. So that's a widespread, and we really need to narrow that spread. And the same is true around the world. Um, you know, we, I, I think it's either the World Health Organization or the United Nations, one of them uses a figure of 2 million people in the world with sickle cell. And we just read a story earlier on that said there were 6 million people in Africa alone, West Africa alone with sickle cell. So we really have to do what we can to get to the bottom of that. We're getting close to the end of our show, and I want to um, touch base on one of the hot topics in the sickle cell field right now, and that is about the effective transitioning for patients, transitioning meaning from childhood care to adult care. And that is going to be the topic of our show next week. We're going to dive into that really deeply, um, but we want to touch kind of gloss the surface with that and just ask Dr. Meyer, um, what role do you play in the process of, of helping to transition patients? Well, I think pediatric hematologists have an important role to play in conjunction with parents and families um, because we need to make sure that we're educating not only the families and the parents, but we're also educating the patients as they get older about what type of sickle cell disease they have, what to do at home to prevent pain, to manage pain in its early stages, how to um, how to interact with healthcare providers that you know you need to tell the doctors and the nurses how you're feeling those kinds of things, because in pediatrics because we deal with children when they're infants and we kind of watch them grow up, we are accustomed to talking to parents and and families, whereas in the adult world, they're not. They're not used to that. They want right. the patients and the they want the patients to talk um, for themselves and to advocate for themselves. So we need to make sure that we're doing a, a, an adequate job of making of educating the patients and making sure that they can be their own advocate when they go to that emergency room when they go when they have to get admitted to the hospital to make sure that they get what they need to take care of themselves. So do you help facilitate that? We do. Um, we actually have a transition um, physician assistant, a physician assistant who's going to um, work with our adolescent sickle cell patients. And at ICC, we're blessed because we have adult providers in the same office. Right. And so pa kids don't have to go to a different um, hospital. They don't have to go to a different doctor's office, which is a big challenge um, when you go somewhere new right. and pe to people who don't know you. So they we have that continuity at IHTC, which is great. And Corey, from your end, uh, you know, could you tell us a little bit about your son's transitioning experience? And, and, you know, maybe we'll bring you back next week if you want to talk about this. Wow. I'll have to think about that one okay. because I think that that was probably the worst and hardest part of it all. Really? Was his transition. Explain why. Um, you go from, it's almost like you go from people caring to mm -hmm. you simply just being there with pain and your feelings or nothing they don't it doesn't matter I actually think that it's probably the hardest part for the patient to transition because their anger levels get to be so high that they probably send them into a horrible crisis and I don't even think that the doctors realize it mm -hmm. but they're not used to they don't one they don't know you mm -hmm. so you're starting off from scratch um, and what I mean by starting off from scratch is very low dosage. They don't know what to give you. They're going to experiment with what they want to experiment. They don't care what, what, what you had. They kind of take it and mold it into their own little personal mm -hmm. um, fun time, as I say. And it is, it's the hardest thing for someone to do. And for, for an adolescent to do that alone would be absolutely brutal. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would t t my advice to all parents is when they're transitioning, stay with your kids at least the first two years, all the time. Good advice, you know. And I think for people that aren't sure about it, um, really, a lot of what happens a lot of the time uh, is that the patients as pediatrics are spoiled, uh, for lack of a better word. 
Um, and, you know, everybody bends over backwards and, you know, speaks to them in the most comforting voices and, you know, gives them uh, milkshakes and ice cream and everything else um, every moment that they have the opportunity to. They get uh, sports players coming through the hospital, signing autographs, all those kinds of things that happen uh, when you're a child with uh, an illness, and particularly in some of the children's hospitals like our Riley Children's Hospital here, that stuff happens all the time and then all of a sudden they're released from that and they go into the cold stark world that most other people experience and it's a shock and so the idea of establishing a good transition program is very important to um, not only help with the continuity of care but also I think to help continue to build up the spirit of the patient um, rather than let the patient's spirit be torn down, which 100%. does happen sometimes. So that's what's really critical and important about this. I would like to ask, um, I think this is our final question, um, Dr. Meyer, what advice would you give any parents that might be listening right now? What what can they do to minimize crises and, and possible health implica- uh, complications? So I would, I would recommend that they talk to their hematologist about hydroxyurea because we know that it decreases painful crises, it decreases acute chest syndromes, decreases unscheduled blood transfusions. Now we know it helps lower TCD velocities. Um, and from the baby hug study, which was that study in infants, those children are now 10 years of age and there are no problems with growth or development in those kids. Um, and so from everything that we have um, and what we know, it's safe to, to take as, from as young as um, one year of age. The other thing is just to maintain good hydration um, and try and make sure that your child's always listening to their body if they feel tired, to rest, you know, always be on the lookout for um, signs of paleness or other signs of anemia. And then in these cold winter months, especially here in the Midwest and in Indiana, make sure they're dressed appropriately um, when they go outside. We certainly don't want sickle cell to limit what they do, but we would just want to make sure that you're always prepared um, to try and do everything you can to prevent the, the complications. And do you also recommend that uh, they look into the stem cell transplants and things I like do. that? I do. I think that it's a really exciting time for transplant. It's, it's exciting that we have a cure for sickle cell um, and the thought that... A, people can live a life that's unencumbered by sickle cells. Very, very exciting. So yes, definitely. it is. Yes, it is. Corey, how about you? As a patient, as a parent, uh, you, you know, you've successfully raised a child with sickle cell. What advice do you have for any parents that might be listening? Honestly, I think the most important is that you allow them to try and live the most normal life they possibly can. Try really hard not to make them feel any different. I know it's hard. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to let them get away with everything because they are sick Mm -hmm. Um, and I did that with quotations and my hands (laughs) Um, but you know we have to really still maintain that they are our children and that they still have to behave in a manner um, that is respectful because this can also make life easier for other patients in, in hospital stays, in, in school, in, in all kinds of situations, we just kind of have to keep it normal. I think keeping their lives normal as if they are normal children the best that we can is the best thing we can do for them. Very well said. Um, Dr. Emily Meyer <laughs> from the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center, thank you very much for being with thank us you. today. Thanks for and having you uh, did wonderful as always. And uh, Corey. Corey Singleton, thank you for being with us today as well. Thank you you for did a great me. job, and I do want you to come back. Well, thank you. I'll be here. Um, as we close the show, we want to leave you with a thought, and it'll start with a quote, and that quote is If you carry joy in your heart, you can heal any moment. Those words were spoken by Carlos Santana. Of course, Carlos Santana is a Mexican and American musician who first became famous in the late 1960s and early 1970s with his band Santana, which pioneered a fusion of rock and Latin American music. He has won 10 Grammy Awards, and he continues to produce world-class music to this day. Sometimes it is far too easy for people to focus on the negative things that surround or affect them. This is true no matter what a person's station in life may be. 
There are many wealthy people who are not content with their lives for some reason or another. There are successful people who commit suicide because they felt empty inside in spite of their achievements. On any given day, anyone can feel pain, sorrow, hopelessness, and despair. One doesn't have to have sickle cell or any other health condition for this to be true. It is just a part of being human. Nearly every day, I hear stories about the massive struggles that sickle cell patients sometimes encounter. Whether it is another hospitalization for a crisis, another surgery, another health complication, or even another shut-off notice, it seems that the life of a sickle cell warrior is often full of obstacles and setbacks. Caring for people as I do makes it hard for me to hear what these warriors have to endure. And then, along comes a warrior with a smile on her face. Before long, another one comes around making a positive statement about the good things that having sickle cell has done for him. When I see these things, Carlos Santana's words become personified. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you. But I'll start by telling you that I have always been an empathetic person. I have the ability to emotionally relate to other people's pain and other people's joy as well. I have spent decades around sickle cell and it has caused me a lot of emotional pain. I just don't like to see anyone suffering for any reason, especially if it's because of something that they themselves did not cause. So when I see a person with sickle cell smiling, or when I hear them say something positive, I feel a sense of healing. The emotional pain that I feel is relieved and it is replaced by a feeling of joy. It becomes a healing moment for me, a moment that I deeply cherish and appreciate. I know that I'm not alone in this. People who spend any amount of time around a sickle cell warrior can tell you the same thing. When joy springs forth from the hearts of those facing chronic illness, it has a tremendous power. It has the power to create joy in those nearby. It also has the power to reverberate back to its source. In other words, making someone happy can make you feel happier too. Yes, I know, this may not be easy to do sometimes, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that it can make a big difference, even when it is only every now and then. What matters is that you become aware that each moment can be a healing moment whenever you allow joy to spring forth from your heart. Let those who care for you see it sometimes. It will do you good, too. That's our show for today. Please join us again next week, same time, same station.